Chapter Thirteen Glinda the Good and the Scarecrow of Oz. That country south of the Emerald City in the land of Oz is known as the Quadling Country, and in the very southernmost part of it stands a splendid palace in which lives Glinda the Good. Glinda is the royal sorceress of Oz. She has wonderful magical powers, and uses them only to benefit the subjects of Ozma's kingdom. Even the famous Wizard of Oz pays tribute to her, for Glinda taught him all the real magic he knows, and she is his superior in all sorts of sorcery. Every one loves Glinda, from the dainty and exquisite ruler Ozma, down to the humblest inhabitant of Oz, for she is always kindly and helpful and willing to listen to their troubles, however busy she may be. No one knows her age, but all can see how beautiful and stately she is. Her hair is like red gold, and finer than the finest silken strands. Her eyes are blue as the sky, and always frank and smiling. Her cheeks are the envy of peach blows, and her mouth is enticing as a rosebud. Glinda is tall, and wears splendid gowns that trail behind her as she walks. She wears no jewels, for her beauty would shame them. For attendants, Glinda has half a hundred of the loveliest girls in Oz. They are gathered from all over Oz, from among the Winkies, the Munchkins, the Gillikins, and the Quadlings, as well as from Ozma's magnificent Emerald City, and it is considered a great favor to be allowed to serve the royal sorceress. Among the many wonderful things in Glinda's palace is the great Book of Records. In this book is inscribed everything that takes place in all the world just the instant it happens, so that by referring to its pages Glinda knows what is taking place far and near in every country that exists. In this way she learns when and where she can help any in distress or danger, and although her duties are confined to assisting those who inhabit the land of Oz, she is always interested in what takes place in the unprotected outside world. So it was that on a certain evening Glinda sat in her library, surrounded by a bevy of her maids, who were engaged in spinning, weaving, and embroidery, when an attendant announced the arrival at the palace of the Scarecrow. This personage was one of the most famous and popular in all the land of Oz. His body was merely a suit of munchkin clothes stuffed with straw, but his head was a round sack filled with bran, with which the Wizard of Oz had mixed some magic brains of a very superior sort. The eyes, nose, and mouth of the scarecrow were painted upon the front of the sack, as were his ears, and since this quaint being had been endowed with life, the expression on his face was very interesting, if somewhat comical. The scarecrow was good all through, even to his brains and while he was naturally awkward in his movements and lacked the neat symmetry of other people, his disposition was so kind and considerate, and he was so obliging and honest, that all who knew him loved him, and there were few people in Oz who had not met our scarecrow and made his acquaintance. He lived part of the time in Ozma's palace at the Emerald City, part of the time in his own corn-cob castle in the Winkie country, and part of the time he traveled over all Oz, visiting with the people and playing with the children whom he dearly loved. It was on one of his wandering journeys that the Scarecrow had arrived at Glinda's palace, and the sorceress at once made him welcome. As he sat beside her, talking of his adventures, he asked, "'What's new in the way of news?' Glinda opened her great book of records, and read some of the last pages. "'Here is an item quite curious and interesting,' she announced, an accent of surprise in her voice. Three people from the big outside world have arrived in Jinxland.' "'Where is Jinxland?' inquired the Scarecrow. "'Very near here, 
a little to the east of us, she said. In fact, Jinxland is a little slice taken off the Quadling country, but separated from it by a range of high mountains, at the foot of which lies a wide, deep gulf that is supposed to be impassable. Then Jinxland is really a part of the land of Oz, said he. Yes, returned Glinda. But Oz people know nothing of it, except what is recorded here in my book. What does the book say about it? asked Scarecrow. It is ruled by a wicked man called King Cruel, although he has no right to the title. Most of the people are good, but they are very timid, and live in constant fear of their fierce ruler. There are several wicked witches who keep the inhabitants of Jinxland in a state of terror. Do those witches have any magical powers? inquired the Scarecrow. Yes. They seem to understand witchcraft in its most evil form, for one of them has just transformed a respectable and honest old sailor, one of the strangers who arrived there, into a grasshopper. This same witch, Blinky by name, is also planning to freeze the heart of a beautiful Jinxland girl named Princess Gloria. Why, that's a dreadful thing to do! exclaimed the Scarecrow. Glinda's face was very grave. She read in her book how Trot and Button Bright were turned out of the King's castle, and how they found refuge in the hut of Pon, the gardener's boy. I'm afraid those helpless earth people will endure much suffering in Jinxland, even if the wicked King and the witches permit them to live, said the good sorceress thoughtfully. I wish I might help them. Can I do anything? asked the Scarecrow anxiously. If so, tell me what to do, and I'll do it. For a few moments Glinda did not reply, but sat musing over the records. Then she said, I am going to send you to Jinxland to protect Trot and Button Bright and Cap'n Bill. All right, answered the Scarecrow in a cheerful voice. I know Button Bright already, for he has been in the Land of Oz before. You remember he went away from the Land of Oz in one of the wizard's big bubbles. Yes, said Glinda, I remember that. Then she carefully instructed the Scarecrow what to do, and gave him certain magical things which he placed in the pockets of his ragged munchkin coat. As you have no need to sleep, said she, you may as well start at once. The night is the same as day to me, he replied, except that I cannot see my way so well in the dark. I will furnish a light to guide you, promised the sorceress. So the scarecrow bade her good-bye, and at once started on his journey. By morning he had reached the mountains that separated the quadling country from Jinxland. The sides of these mountains were too steep to climb, but the Scarecrow took a small rope from his pocket and tossed one end upward into the air. The rope unwound itself for hundreds of feet, until it caught upon a peak of rock at the very top of the mountain, for it was a magic rope furnished him by Glinda. The Scarecrow climbed the rope and, after pulling it up, let it down on the other side of the mountain range. When he descended the rope on this side, he found himself in Jinxland, but at his feet yawned the great gulf, which must be crossed before he could proceed any farther. The Scarecrow knelt down and examined the ground carefully, and in a moment he discovered a fuzzy brown spider that had rolled itself into a ball. So he took two tiny pills from his pocket and laid them beside the spider, which unrolled itself and quickly ate up the pills. Then the scarecrow said in a voice of command, Spin! And the spider obeyed instantly. In a few moments the little creature had spun two slender but strong strands that reached way across the gulf one being five or six feet above the other. When these were completed, 
the scarecrow started across the tiny bridge, walking upon one strand as a person walks upon a rope, and holding to the upper strand with his hands to prevent him from losing his balance and toppling over into the gulf. The tiny threads held him safely, thanks to the strength given them by the magic pills. Presently he was safe across and standing on the plains of Jinxland. Far away he could see the towers of the king's castle, and toward this he at once began to walk. End of chapter 13